Give the honor. We are going to start our session, and that's why, uh, dear friends, uh, when we will conference classmates, I greet you and wish success in this uh, session. Yes, I welcome you in our sunny country and also in our University of uh, Languages. I hope at the end of the conference, each of us uh, will gain uh, something new. That's uh, our as our uh, session is called Culture and Art. I hope this session will be very fun and interesting. First of all, I want uh, to to give a speech, uh, Dr. Gülfekin Shamilli. Uh, she is a, uh, from the uh, State Institute of Art Studies, uh, Moscow. Uh, her lecture is about uh, is called the heritage of uh, Caucasian Jews in the context of Middle East oral musical traditions. Uh, she is Doctor of Science, uh, leading research state Institute of Art Studies. Please, dear Kiltekin. They are trying to connect. Rhythm. 
uh, it's uh, very typical for uh, near Eastern musical, oral musical tradition and how this melodies with free rhythm. Uh, these melodies are uh, associated with uh, professional temple rituals, uh, lamentations, for example, in ancient, in antiquity, uh, it was lamentations of Isis and uh, names for Osiris, fixed in Hebrew as Shireni, or two song lamentations. Later, this type of music making was conceptualized in the world of Makam, etymologically uh, going back to the ancient Aramaic Makam and Hebrew Makom in the meaning of place and location. Today's points, uh, it points uh, to musical genres too, one of uh, which, Muham, has also become a part, uh, part of the Jews' heritage of Caucasian Azerbaijan and is sung in their native language. This type of music making isn't divided into religious or secular music. And uh, it's heard in uh, Tamise, for example, the sample of liturgical uh, singing uh, performed by Rabbi Rahmoni, and also in Muhammad, which is so fully performed by Yossi Bariuhai in his native language, uh, to his second and third Uh, both, both examples were collected 
to the bar frame as musician, he is a little All it appears we cannot only hear the international vocabulary of melodies that have disappeared from the daily life of Caucasian Jews today, especially from the synagogue worship, but also revived these melodies uh, as uh, Hebrew was revived. I would like to give one of, uh, of the variants of the Hadrodi melody, which is unlikely to be sung in the Caucasus as we are going to hear now. It's, uh, it's known that mountain Jew is an exonym, whereas the exonym is Jehur. And it's believed that there are no written searches in, in which it would be possible to find uh, confirmation for this exoic noise. Uh, next, please. Okay. Uh, however, I have uh, read this exoic noise on a unique postcard of the early 20th century with an in Jewish family. Uh, in the upper right corner of this photo, we read in Persian, Ahlis Damyali Juhur, not Juhur. But Juhur uh, literally means uh, literally uh, means Jews are blood blood related. Uh, the fact that the letter Ra is not Dal may be confirmed by any experts of handwritten Arabic texts. Uh, most likely, uh, based on the elements of clothing, it can be assumed that. These are Jews of Kurdistan. In this case, it is not as important as the fact that modern Caucasian Jews uh, is keeping uh, the memory about Persia. In confirmation, I would quote the words of the outstanding scientist Mikhail Garunov. He writes, My grandfather's great Grandfather, Kohen Sagai Aaron Irani, being a courtner of the Shah of Iran, fled, according to the family legend, to Baku from his disfavor. In the late 18th or early 19th century, having married a mountain Jew in Baku, he soon settled in the Jewish settlement of Kuba in the Gileki quarter. And uh, from his only son came our Agarunov's family, some of whose represent representatives, including my grandfather uh, Mikhail Yahyu Agarun, were coins in the synagogues. Uh, I can only add that the son of Mikhail, sons, two sons of Mikhail Agarunov were born already in Baku. There, Mother to Ram Hanum, a cousin, a cousin of a, a nice or niece of my uh, grandmother, on the line of uh, the Hayat family, also uh, associated with the uh, pearl of Karabakh Shusha city. The second legend, a uh, stretch uh, thread from uh, the musical heritage of. Caucasian Jews to the Middle Asia reveals the significant role of Jews in the core environment of the Azerbaijani Qajar dynasties. Next, please. Uh, yes. The legend uh, was recorded by uh, American ethnomusicologist Lawrence Love in 1960. Aid in San Andaj, the administrative center of Kurdistan. By the legend, Ishaq, one of the great musicians during the uh, region of Nasreddin Shah, uh, was called away from the synagogue, one young Kimurera, to play for the Shah. 
who was in especially melancholy mood. Obliged uh, to serve the Shah, Ishaq played his star and sang. But the melodies were those he had heard in all evening in the synagogue. When the Shah asked why such exceedingly delightful melodies were being performed this evening, Ishaq replied that they were from the most sacred of Jewish players from which he had been forced to separate by order of the Shah. He was then swiftly returned to the synagogue amidst great price and uh, uh, with a present of much fine gold. I would draw your attention to the transmission of synagogue melodies into the palace music. It's very interesting link. Uh, and. Uh, which once again confirms the conventionality of divining not only Jewish but also Middle Asian musical heritage into religious and secular. There isn't a strong dichotomy. Secondly, the fact that Ishak played on the Tara sense isn't allowed in Azerbaijan or Persian musical traditions because of specific way of sound production of the tar. The study of this paradox led me to Kuba City. I was shocked by a previously discovered video recording of the 90s in which Nisim Nisimov played the tar and at the same time sang Mugam, a shur in Azerbaijan. Next, please. <laughs> I would like to thank the executive director of this Mendy Society, Daniel Daniel, for organizing my meeting in Cuba with Nisim Nisimov. Formerly a professional musician, Nisim Nisimov takes part in the city administration and finds time to and energy to teach young parishioners of the central city synagogue, where I had a meeting with young Hazans. He has been started in Jerusalem and sang me the whole day on Ashkenazi tune. There is a little bit of pause in the beginning of this uh, recording. Let's wait some seconds. Oh boy, it's <laughs> Да, матки се до нас кон нас, се до нас. Вот э Ти спи краше на за сада, за я сада на центру кубасна. Хавена и нож там го. Е хадо де it isn't Ashkenazi, and uh, he's trying to to to, to sing uh, authentic, yeah, Mizrahi from Mizrahi Lehadodis, and uh, they. Uh, no, 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 Oh, my God.
זה אותנטיקל.
Diverse soil flora and fauna, convenient routes uh, connecting uh, west and east, north and south. Azerbaijan has, linked be, uh, has long been a country where tribes and groups of different origin aspired within, and this uh, played an important. Uh, this country played an important uh, role as a natural bridge for people of uh, different religions and uh, ethnic minorities. Now, uh, it's no doubt uh, we see a, a multicolored uh, palette of ethnic uh, minorities in Azerbaijan. They haven't lost their origin, their um, ethnopsychology, their uh, mentality, language, culture, and even uh, the memory of their past. They live in here, so safety, peace, it's no doubt. Mm, and among these ethnic minorities are the uh, mountain Jews, yeah? uh, descendants of ancient Jewish uh, tribes who left their historical homeland after the destruction uh, of the first temple in Jerusalem uh, in the 6th century BC. Now, you can see here uh, Gurmus Gesebe, okay? uh, Red Town in English, uh, where uh, it's uh, uh, one of the uh, towns that Jews live in a compact form with safety. Now, it should be not said some information about Azerbaijan and its history can be found in several Jewish sources. Uh, one of them is Benjamin Tudela. Uh, maybe you know him? Okay, Benjamin Tudela's studio also can say. Over. Yes, Benjamin of Tudela. Is a major figure in medieval geography and uh, Jewish history. Some information about the role and place of Azerbaijan in Jewish history is available in the Journey of Benjamin Tudelsky, it's uh, 12th, uh, 12th century, who lived in the era of late Arab Caliphate. Okay, got it. The Travels of Benjamin is an important work not only as a description of the Jewish communities, but also as a reliable source about the geography and ethnography of the Middle Ages. Also, he doesn't directly speak about this country. He mentions the territories that were under the conventional jurisdiction of the exiled head of the Kairut, Kairut Jewish community outside uh, Israel, in Baghdad. Okay, Kairut, uh, it did Kairut Kola, it's the term of uh, Hebrew language, and I would like to read it, and I am, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I have written here. Kairut, the Hebrew term Kairut expresses a Jewish conception of the uh, condition and feelings of a nation uh, uprooted from its homeland and subject to aligned rule. The term is essentially applied to the uh, history and historical uh, consciousness of the Jewish people from the destruction of the uh, Second Temple to the creation of Israel State. So, uh, we can see the first documented information about Jewish communities and settlements in Azerbaijan dates back to the uh, 12th century. In the 12th and uh, 14th centuries, Azerbaijan was an integral part and the central region of the Mongolian Ilkhan state. And during this period, according to Fischl, uh, the country turned into an important center of Eastern Jewry. Uh, because Jews from uh, Muslim countries immigrated here at the, and, uh, as the Ilkhans were distinguished by certain tolerance. Another author of the 12th century, Samuel Ben Ali, was the most prominent and important of the 12th uh, century Babylon scholars and uh, the only one of the neo geonic period whose written work has survived. Samuel Ben Ali is more specific than uh, Benjamin Tudelsky, reporting on the Eastern Jewish communities and the names of their settlement in the Iranian geographical space part of which was present today South Azerbaijan in ancient times. Rashid at uh, oh, I, I think uh, everyone uh, knows him. Rashid Akhtin, Fazulba Rashid Akhtin. 
The most prominent well-known statesman and cultural figure of the medieval Jewish community of Azerbaijan, Rashid Abdaullah, was born in the family of a Jewish pharmacist in the city of Hamadan. He is better known as Rashid Din in Azerbaijan. Uh, Rashid Din Fazlullah Abu Al Khair Hamadani. At the age of, the, uh, of 30, Rashid Ad Dawla converted to Islam after which he received the name Rashid Ad Din. We say in English uh, Rashid Ad Din. Under him, Azerbaijani cities of Tabriz and Marara turned into centers of attraction for scholars of the Muslim world. At his own expense, Rashid Ad-Din built the Ruby Rashidi quarter, okay, the name of this quarter, Ruby Rashidi, uh, uh, on the outskirts of the capital Tabriz, which became one of the outstanding social and cultural centers of the East. John F. Tabarich, okay, the collection of Chronicles. Uh, he is known uh, for his much, uh, much worthy work, John F. Tabarich, The History of the World, uh, the collection of Chronicles. Uh, thus, he became a historian under the Ilkhanate of the Mon uh, Mongol Empire. Kazan Khan appointed him as his Grand Vizier, Vizier we say in Azerbaijan language, and he wrote the World uh, History publication. Compendium of Chronicles at the start of the 14th century, these uh, 400 volumes. The work contains a special chapter. The name of this chapter is uh, I translated it, The History of the Sons of Israel. Okay, in English, uh, we translated it uh, like that. But this chapter is still uh, remained unpublished. It should be specially not that everything that came out from the pen of Rashid Adin made a noticeable and significant contribution to uh, medieval Jewish scholarship, which was able uh, to develop on the fertile soil of Azerbaijan. Among the famous Jewish, uh, famous Jews of that time, whose life and work are closely connected with Azerbaijan, uh, stands out Abu Al Faraj, John uh, Gregory Bar in Bay. Okay, uh, just about uh, we can say uh, his name. Uh, for many years, Bar uh, Ebrei, I'm sorry, Ebrei, Bar Ebrei, was engaged in scientific research and teaching at the Maraha uh, Observatory. Uh, uh, here I uh, noted uh, what the Maraha Observatory and when uh, was it built. He lectured on a quilt and Ptolemy, compiled astronomical, astronomical uh, tables for beginners and uh, scholars. According to the author, when working on historical works, he used uh, the rich collection of uh, the Maraha Library. At the Maraha Observatory, uh, for many years, there has been a collection of funny and humorous stories grouped into a uh, language, Syriac, uh, the title of story and music stories, and in Arabic. Warriors of Exile. Bar Ibrahim died in Maraha on June uh, 30, uh, 12, uh, 86, and the inhabitants of the city, as a contemporary note, rendered the greatest honor to his memory. All the shops were closed that day, uh, closed that day and no one was minding their own business. According to uh, researchers, Bar Ibrahim was a personality similar to his famous contemporaries of the Latin medieval world, which is another, uh, this, uh, the name of the world, Vincent de uh, Belois and Albert the Great, which is uh, another proof of the role uh, of Azerbaijan in the history of Eastern Jewry. And, 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 <laughs> this is the main point for me. How is the country of Israel reflected in the works of young Azerbaijan teachers? The book entitled Israel, Culture and Art was jointly compiled by Faye Nadir Gaza Abdullah. Uh, she's also, uh, meanwhile, my, was my teacher, now we are colleagues, and by me. 
Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, why we uh, decided to wrote book under this name? Because, first of all, I would like to point out that besides the Hebrew language, like our university, uh, students are taught many subjects related to Israel. One of them is Israel culture and art. There is no systematic materials related to this subject in uh, the Azerbaijan language. Uh, there are too many uh, okay, uh, materials, but systematically it's difficult to find out. And so every time the materials are translated and given to the st students, and the students have trouble finding materials in this direction every time, that's why we saw the best way uh, is to write a book uh, under uh, that name. This book is a source for strengthening knowledge about Israel culture and art of the modern stage. The book which systematically contained information about Israel was written uh, in the Azerbaijan language and we think it will play an important role in the development of students' knowledge. And if, uh, dear Ben Mora, uh, if you have any uh, words about this work, because you are, uh, no, you don't know? <coughs> Thank you, good night uh, for, I need to okay. Yes, of course. Yes, uh, I thank you, Gunai, that uh, she mentioned uh, our book. But uh, still, uh, we uh, finished this book and we are going uh, to uh, publish it. Uh, maybe. It's still unpublished. <laughs> yes, it's still unpublished. And uh, yes, uh, we want uh, to. Uh, publish this book and uh, also I uh, think, think that yeah, we, we both uh, think that it uh, will be a great book uh, that uh, about the Israel art and culture uh, from ancient time to the modern time. We also mentioned uh, the Jews who live uh, not only in Israel, uh, both uh, who li live in abroad in Latin America, USR, Russia, Europe, and uh, so on. We try uh, to combine all uh, Israel uh, culture Jew and also Jewish culture uh, uh, from the beginning till the modern time. That's all I want to add. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going uh, to present our third uh, lectures. Uh, she is uh, Mrs. Nihama Lavi. Uh, her lecture is called Music of Caucasian Jews at an Expression of Multiculturalism and Environmental Influence. Uh, Nahama Lavi is a researcher from Barjilan University and is about to finish her PhD in music therapy from the music department. Nahama is a pianist and a piano teacher, a composer, a music therapist and a, a psychotherapist. She studied for her bachelor degree and for her artist diploma in the Academy of Music in Jerusalem and for her uh, master in music therapy in Bar Ilan University. Her current research under Professor Edward Bodner is about integrating uh, mindfulness and music in therapy. Yeah, I invite her uh, to present her lecture. Yeah, Okay. 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 Uh, so shalom. Shalom. Uh, shalom, shalom. 
My name is Nekama uh, Lavi. I'm very happy. Ah, oh, wow, I hear you with me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. Shalom, my name is Nekama Lavi. I'm very happy and very excited to be here. Ah, no one is putting earphones. Maybe you can take a rest. Yes, enjoy. <laughs> I'll start again. <laughs> uh, my name is Nekama Lavi. I'm uh, very happy to be here. I'm uh, from uh, the music department in uh, Barilan University. I'm uh, doing my PhD under the supervision of uh, Professor Ewald Bodner, who is amazing, and I'm so grateful to him, and I thank him so much. And I'm about to submit my dissertation next month. As you can see, my, uh, I'm going to talk about the music of the mountain Jews, and actually I'm going to bring a very specific angle. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, something general about music. Music is not just fun and entertainment. It has much more important and deep meaning in human life. There's music everywhere, in all the cultures all over the world. In ancient times, people invested a lot of effort in creating instruments for war, for food, and for music. And it's incredible, because we can understand from it that music has to do something with survival, psychological survival, spiritual survival, and there's a lot of research about music as an expression of self-identity, both for individuals and for groups and societies. Music preferences are linked to our sense of identity. Our musical tastes and preferences can form an important statement of our values and attitudes. Composers and performers use their music to express their own distinctive views of the world. But first, let's have a short listening to this wonderful music of the month, Mountain Jude, to get the sense. <laughs> Uh, you see the the, the flute, 
Usually, if you have only one in the ensemble, then it will be used for the what we call bourdon, for a very, very long note that's uh, being played throughout the piece. So the player uses circular breathing. It's inhaling and exhaling in the same time. So there is no stop to take air. It just goes on the whole piece. And uh, if you have more than one flute, then the others will play the melody. And down there you see the oud. The oud you, you hold like a guitar, and it has uh, four strings, and uh, you play it with the, the fingers. And there are many more uh, instruments, some of them ancient, some of them joined later, but uh, I, I couldn't bring uh, all the, but you got the idea of the ancient uh, instrument. So uh, the second thing I want to uh, discuss is uh, uh, the use of improvisation. And here I'd like to elaborate a little. The art of improvising is about being here and now, reacting to whatever is happening right this moment, within yourself or in your environment. It's not random or chaotic music, because it's based on a basic plan that lies underneath. Like you heard, they started playing a familiar song all together, and then the flute started improvising. And while he improvises, all the rest were playing something, uh, what we call the uh, ostinato accompaniment which is a, a very regular repeating. Uh, here it was like two notes in a repeating rhythm. So there's some basic musical phrases or motives or melodies that the players agree on. And the players also agree about the makam or scale that they use. But all the time they need to listen carefully and follow whatever musical moves their partners make. So it's a skill of being tuned to whatever is going on right now noticing changes and acting according to whatever is happening. You must be spontaneous and accept moves of others. So improvising is a lot about being flexible and creative. If you're in a jam session, that's the way to survive it. And I use the word survive in purpose, because I agree with Darwin that being able to improvise is a survival skill. Earlier today, we heard a wonderful, fascinating lecture of about to become Dr. Alisa Abramov, about what the Jewish uh, community faces. And also yesterday and today, we heard about uh, the, the area and what they're going uh, through. And adjusting is understanding the current situation and reacting to it in the best appropriate way. The ability to adjust the changes has to do with well-being and mental health. Improvising and listening to improvising is influences mind, influences the attitude towards the unknown, our attitude when we deal with uncertainty. Instead of fear and worry, you get used to an attitude of being curious and creative. It forms your state of mind. One more thing about improvisation. I think improvisation also represents hope because you keep a state of mind where all the options are open but we will get back to it later. Let's continue with the music. So we talked about improvisation. And before we mentioned the, the playing of a long note, remember the bourdon, uh, what we call in the West uh, pedal note or... Uh, so uh, it's a bass, long, stable tone that keeps going on and on, and on top of it, the other lines of the music. So it's like a floor, like a ground something solid, something to count on. My PhD is about the influence of music elements on our mental health. The processing of sound and music is among our very early basic skills. It's happening in the very early brain region. As I mentioned in the beginning, music is sometimes considered as entertainment, like a spice to life. But actually, it has much more fundamental purpose in human life. Another thing is the use of a very limited choice of notes. Tetrachord is a scale of only four notes. While improvising, sometimes you're decorating it with a neighbor note, so it becomes five or six notes, but that's it. And it's very great. It's like giving a painter four colors to paint with. Dark blue, blue, light blue, a little lighter blue, 
maybe a little white, and that's it. We get this palette, and with it, you have to be creative. So here it's four notes, one next to the other. And that's what you have to work with. Let's listen to a sample. Here it is. This is my home. I was born here. My parents were born here. Over there, that's our historic homeland, from where our forefathers came a long time ago. But this here is our second home, and it's no less dear to me than the other one. My children are able to live over there. They know Israel well. But for the time being, you know, I want to be over there and here at the same time. You're asking who is it? His name is Ilya Davido. He's a painter, a Jewish painter. Jewish what? Jewish painter. So he describes the conflict very well, and you can hear the longing. We all have conflicts with our self-identities. For example, being a mother and having a career, I'm sure each one of you has a conflict of, of your own. The music is a wonderful way to express coexistence, different ideas, beliefs, and styles. It allows combining different aspects in harmony. Music helps us define our self-identity, either consciously or unconsciously. Think about your place. Think about your children's place. Look how it can define a person. Not long ago, I was in the airport in Rome, and on my way to the gate, there was a big red piano. So I sat, and I started playing Israeli songs. It took maybe two minutes. Many, many, many Israelis gathered around, asked, 
can you play this, can you do this, everybody singing together. So it connected us all, we were connected through the music. And sharing the same music makes you feel part of a group. And it's the same with the Mountain Jews. They have their own music that connects them and unites them. So what is unique specifically? No. What is unique specifically in the music of the Mountain Jews? What keeps their self-identity among their neighbors and among all the influences? Well, it's the language, using the jewelry, the Jewish language, and it also helps to preserve the language. And you can have in this area the same uh, lullaby sung by a Jewish mother and the mothers from all same song, but each one will use her own language. The second is the context. What was the music created for? Where, where was it played and performed? As if uh, it's a occasion, Jewish occasions or Jewish uh, ceremonies. So the context makes it specifically Jewish. Third, the theme, the content. What is the text about? Texts that are about Jewish life, about the Torah, about Israel. <laughs> The Mount of Jews were always longing for Israel, never forgotten Israel. And when some of them made Aliyah, the identity conflict was there. The balance between the identities that exist simultaneously was shaken again. They wanted to be Israeli more than any other identity that they hold. It is mostly the young ones who were embarrassed to be different. They tried to be like the Israeli Sephardi. They just wanted to blend. But then, when they started to feel Israeli like any other Israelis and confident about belonging, they felt secure enough to show their uniqueness. They started going back to the roots and to the Caucasian identity, Caucasian identity to be Israeli and yet preserve the unique culture and unique music. And nowadays, this music is getting more and more popular and the children of the mountain Jews who live in Israel are bringing their culture back to life and even on stage with pride. The mountain Jews have combined their belonging and loyalty to the country where they always lived in for many centuries with their neighbors together with the belonging to the Jewish people and even belonging to the state of Israel. The music allows it and enables it in a way that makes it possible to hold on to the different identities and keep them together in harmony. <laughs> Okay, and the last speech uh, 
is going uh, Mark, our present. Mount Kiliyam, do you learn? I mean, yes, Mount Kiliyam. Do you think it's here, coming here. from Adam Bicham? No, no, no. He is inspired. Uh, he, he inspired from Habil Ali. He was our Itamancha uh, artist and came here and learned Kamancha. Uh, Kamancha. In the class of uh, Adalet Vizirov. Yes, Adalet Vizirov. Yeah. Adalet Vizirov is very uh, famous as a Bajani Kamancha player and Mark uh, was her he, his student yes. uh, about two years. He lived, he lived in his house. <coughs> oh, wow. Yes, and yes, two years class, in Baku. And also they played the tar? Yes. Uh, I mean, his, I, I mean, because I know the both of them, him and his son. Yeah, yes, Kiris, Kiris played uh, Iranian tar, tar, not Azerbaijani tar. Mm. Uh, you, you have just seen. He played Iranian tar, uh, but uh, Mark, his son, uh, played uh, Azerbaijani Kamancha. It's a uh, common instrument for all uh, Central uh, and Middle Asia, Kamancha. And the word Kamancha, Kamancha, yes, from Kamancha, Persian. yes. From here? Kamancha from Persian Kaman. Okay, from yes. the Persian. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Arabic. No, 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 only Persian. No, but in, in Arabic it became Kamancha. Kamancha. Friends, can I encourage you to have this uh, side? I'd like to have my full 15 yeah. minutes. I know that we have. Okay. We're also already over time. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, uh, we have the last uh, presentation uh, from uh, Arie, Mr. Arya David uh, Sharmik. Uh, his lecture is about the Geo Museum, oh no, uh, documentation and photography uh, from the villages. Uh, he is, holds uh, MBA in environmental studies with the uh, emphasis in anthropology from uh, Prescott College, Arizona, USA, and uh, a MBA. A master degree in a cross cultural and sustainable business management from the American University of Paris. His passion uh, for the history, stories, and culture of the Jews of Azerbaijan originated from stories he heard as a young boy from his rugby father of Jews living in the Caucasus Mountains. He currently resides in Northern Carolina, working as a Jewish youth educator and adventure guide. Yes. I'll keep this fairly succinct. Um, so just a um, small correction. I live in California, and I came here all the way from California to participate. And so I will just um, offer a bit of context about myself as well. Um, I'm not going to stand here with the pretense that I'm an academic. I'm a bit of the odd duck here. Um, and I wanted to give some backstory on how did I even end up here in Azerbaijan. Uh, uh, the Mark Eliyahu, as you know, is, he is from also uh, Dagestan. He uh, inspired uh, from our uh, artist uh, Habil. Uh, and came here and learned Kamancha, and now he is presenting his music with the Kamancha. Okay, and the last speech uh, is going uh, Mark, our present. Mark Kiliyam, do you learn? I mean, yes, Mark Kiliyam. Do you think it's coming from Adam Bicham? No, 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 he is inspired, uh, he, he inspired from Habil Ali, he was our Kamancha. Uh, artist and came here and learned Kamancha, uh, in, in, Kamancha. in the class of uh, Adalet Vizirov. Yes, Adalet Vizirov. Yeah. Adalet Vizirov is very uh, famous as a Bajani Kamancha player and Mark uh, was her, he, his student uh, about two years. He lived, also, he lived in his house. <coughs> oh, wow. Yes, yes, and two years in the Baku. And also they played the tar? Yes. Uh, I mean, his, I, I mean, because I know the both of them, him and his son. Yeah, yes. Kiris, Kiris played uh, Iranian tar, tar, not Azerbaijani tar. Mm. Uh, you, you have just seen. He played Iranian tar, uh, but uh, Mark, his son, uh, played uh, Azerbaijani Kamancha. It's a it's, uh, common instrument for all uh, Central uh, and Middle Asia. Kamancha. 
in the southern region of Azerbaijan. So um, one of the, the most famous place that people know about is Privolnia in uh, southern Azerbaijan. But I also understood through interviews that I was conducting in Privolnia that there was also Subotnik Ger heritage in Lankaran. So the place marks uh, where Lankaran is on the map for those who are not familiar. So uh, these are just images that I want to share with you. Um, these are places that, as far as I know, um, have no other documentation of um, Hebrew uh, grave sites. Um, these graves were all moved from their original location in Lankaran um, and now exist in the main cemetery of the city. But as you can see, clearly there was uh, a tradition of writing in Hebrew, whether we identify Subotnik and Ger people as officially Jewish is obviously a matter of discussion. But I found it very interesting when I interviewed Subotnik people and Ger people in Privonia, and I asked them, what's the difference between Subotnik and Ger? And they said, Subotnik, don't, Subotnik turn lights on on Shabbat, and Ger don't turn on lights on Shabbat. And I found that to be a very amusing description. So these are just um, some of the graves that are located there. Also and in Lankara? Yeah, really? in Lankara. Really? Yeah. She is from Lankara. I am from Lankara. 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 Pardon? What village? Uh, Lankaran. It's close to Iran on the far southern coast of Azerbaijan. No, but, but what no, no, in Lankaran, what village this grave? Oh, it's in Lankaran city. Ah, in city. city. Yeah, in ah, city. Okay, okay. Yeah. City, this is old uh, cemetery. Cemetery, cemetery yeah. 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 Really? Yeah. So those graves really? were moved from their original location to the main cemetery in, in Lankaran. Very, mm -hmm. very interesting. Pardon? When it, is, it, was, un, it was unclear. I interviewed the, the local cemetery keeper, mm. and this was the, the story that he shared with me, but it was unclear about the date of their removal from their original location. And so in my time there, I also interviewed people and collected stories. I was not functioning as um, specifically there to verify these stories or not, just collecting oral histories. And um, nonetheless, it was very interesting, some of the stories that I encountered. And so this was a, a woman named Masha, who I uh, was informed uh, had Subotnik Ger heritage, and we interviewed and spoke with her, and there she is with a picture of her sister on the wall, and she recalled stories of her sister going to synagogue in Lankaran. And so after more digging and asking questions, she shared with us the location of the synagogue in Lankaran. This is its current status, a uh, defunct Degwondo uh, hall, um, but that is the original synagogue that existed in Lankaran, and she had memories of her sister obviously walking there, but we don't have specific stories of what uh, Jewish life was like and practice. But what I found really amazing um, was the ubiquity of many Jewish values in that community. So when I went, for example, to Privonia, um, I met this really wonderful man uh, named Alexander. We arrived at his house at 10.30 in the morning, and immediately he welcomes me in, pours me some homemade blackberry vodka, and we spent three days um, in his home. We tried to insist that we would go to a hotel, and he was absolutely insistent, absolutely not. He knew what day of the Omer it was. He was counting the Omer. Um, so it was very interesting. So you know, these values of Jewish values, hachnasak ochim, hospitality to guests, um, and generosity, um, as well as his connection to so many of the practices was very interesting to note. Um, he identified himself as coming from Subotnik heritage himself, but he basically functions today as the unofficial rabbi of Privonia. And so again, these are just some images from the graves and the cemetery in, in Privonia. So those mountains in the background are, are basically the border with Iran. And so that was in the main cemetery, the previous slide, but this next slide is actually just in an open field. And I don't know if you can really see it due to the image quality as it's presented on here, but you can see Hebrew inscription written on this grave. So uh, I think that um, my main purpose in sharing this information and hope from, from some of this is that uh, you'll hear at the end of the day a probably very fascinating presentation from Rabbi Zamir about the restoration of the Magia Cemetery. Um, and I think that there's, um, plenty of other Jewish sites as well that um, could really use attention in terms of the preservation and documentation of uh, our people's history in the country. So just one other small story because I was able, like I said, really privileged to go all over the country and speak with 
Jewish people in Gansha, document cemeteries in Yevlach, places that people don't really think about as having Jewish history and presence of uh, Jewish, um, Jewish heritage. Yeah, okay, so you know, Ohuz and Ismail are like more known, uh, definitely off the beaten path from Guba, but you know, some of these other places um, less documented. But this was really the most uh, incredible one of all the places I was able to go. It's a small, small village high in the mountains, um, probably about 20 kilometers as the crow flies from uh, Lahij village, but a very difficult one hour to an hour and a half mountain road to get there. And I was informed about it by a mountain guide friend of mine who works for the company here at Camping Azerbaijan because they go deep into the mountains and talk with villagers all the time. And he met a man named Aslan from Chulian village who, there's an image of Chulian village deep in the mountains. And this man Aslan insisted that he had seen a, set, a grave a headstone that had not only a Star of David on it, but also a Hebrew inscription. So I went deep into the mountains to meet with Aslan and talk with him. So those mountains in the background are where Lahich is located. And then in the distance is another village called Mudri, which also reported, yeah, Mudri, which also had um, reported Jewish history in it. And this was the headstone. Unfortunately, the bottom part of it that he claimed had a Hebrew inscription had gone missing. And as we know, the Star of David was adopted much later here in the region, so the fact that there is a Star of David does not inherently mean that this was a Jewish cemetery, but it is very interesting that there is this story of Jewish heritage there. There is this headstone with um, a Star of David on it that allegedly had Hebrew inscription. And um, one of the stories that Aslan talked about was that um, there were other villages higher in the mountains that he referred to that were eventually destroyed through landslides. So the purpose of this is just to demonstrate the instability of the terrain there. And he specifically referred to a village that he referred to as Juhudkand. Yeah, which I found very, very interesting. So uh, this is the book that he uh, shared with me for those who want a reference. Again, whether or not these are historically accurate or not is um, a matter of discussion and probably worthy of further research. But in this uh, book about the region, um, it mentioned the Jewish settlement in the region in Wudri. It discussed them leaving the region and eventually settling in um, in moving to Mujie, which then it becomes Mujie. Then those Jews eventually leave Mujie and go to Mujie Haftaran. And what was particularly interesting about Aslan's narrative is that he said that the people of Julian originally come from Geshresh, which is near Guba. So he was suggesting that perhaps the narrative of migration that is to be told there is a narrative of Jews leaving from the Guba region with the people of Geshresh, moving up and over the mountains, because if we look back here at this um, location, you can see where Guba is north of Julian and the uh, east-west Caucasus Mountains, and then coming up and over the mountains. So, um, you know, these are stories of migration and, um, and Jewish movement throughout the region. Uh, and I think probably uh, someone with a greater academic credentials and um, forensic anthropological background, plus perhaps um, some investment in archaeological uh, investigation in this region might reveal really incredible findings, similar to what um, Rabbi uh, Zamir will share with you later this evening. This is a picture he shared with me from the restoration of the Majid Cemetery. Um, it was once overgrown and now has been restored and is a really um, fascinating place. Uh, they were able to uh, document um, really interesting histories through the headstones there. So this uh, final image is just an image that sort of connects the whole imagery. This is taken from the Jihad Taran, looking in the direction of Ismaila, looking in the direction of the mountains of Julian, where they might have come from. So if you're interested, uh, unfortunately I saw that um, the mapping uh, aspect of our, um, of our internet museum is, uh, is down right now. I hope it will be restored, but the Diarna Geo Museum it has the exhibit of uh, the places that I've documented, um, um, more than 40 sites throughout the country. And um, if you want to follow, now my content is more about my own personal mountain adventures because that's how I got into this. But nonetheless, I also have information on my Instagram if you want to know more of these stories.
Thank you. Thank you.